Ralph Echemendia is a world-renowned cybersecurity expert, known internationally as the Ethical Hacker. For over 20 years, Ralph has delivered training on hacking and other security information to corporations including Google, Microsoft, Intel and even NASA. Ralph took his talents to Hollywood and has worked with award-winning director Oliver Stone on films such as Savages and Snowden. He has also worked on other projects such as the film Nerve and TV series Mr. Robot. Welcome to the Web Summit stage, The Ethical Hacker. Well, hello, Web Summit. And physical technical issue. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. I'm honored to be here. This is an amazing event so far, and we have some amazing people that we're going to be talking to. First, I, I want to say thank you to the production folks uh, and the people who put this on, the organizers, because uh, they really do a heck of a job in putting this on. So let's give them a round of applause, please. All right, so computer hacking. I've been doing this for 25 years. And in that time, a lot has changed as far as technology, but not the issue. The issue itself of security and what it means to us is pretty much still the same issue. In fact, there's more hacking today in the sense of you're hearing about it a lot more. Uh, I'd say 10 years ago, I could have never thought that hacking would become such a geopolitical issue. So now, let's, let's talk about what hackers are and what hackers are not. I think hackers, for the most part, that's a term that the media tends to use that is a criminal word. Uh, I, rem I, I remember telling my kids, trying to explain to them uh, what a hacker was, and it was kind of funny because uh, my daughter asked me, um, who's now 18, and she said to me, okay, so uh, you're like a criminal? After she kind of learned what it was, and I said, no, no, no. She said, but, but you're like a bank robber just with computers. I said, no, no, I'm doing it legitimately. The bank hires me to break in, and then I explain uh, how I did that, and then they fix that. And then she said, yes, but how did you learn how to break into the bank? And then it got a little tricky in explaining that. So let me put it to you this way. There are basically four kinds of people in the world, and uh, hackers can be classified as two of these types. People who know and do things, people who know and don't do things, people who don't know and do things, and people who don't know and don't do things. Okay, so hackers are basically people who know and do things, and people who don't know and do things. Because when I got started, I didn't know what I was actually looking at. I just had to learn how to learn really quickly. And that's really the trick about what hackers do. And then you basically go even deeper and deeper into what you're learning about. So, I always like to use the analogy of a light bulb. And uh, this comes from a friend of mine who actually used this as an exercise. And it's one that you guys can use, too, for a lot of different things, for, even for hiring purposes, so that you can look into the creative mind. It's a very creative process. And so, for example, you have a light bulb on the ceiling, and you've got a switch on the wall, and you have to think of 10 different ways to turn off the light bulb. Okay, so that could be a password, that could be a website, whatever that is, but you have to start thinking through it. So you start thinking, okay, I flick the switch, I break the bulb, rip out the wiring, unscrew the bulb. Anybody? Come on, throw them at me. Any ideas on how to turn off a light? Shoot it. Oh, watch out for that guy. Okay, so, but the point is, the first five you kind of come up with really quickly. And there is another five. What happens if you put a brighter light source next to that light? Can you see the light? Um, ask someone else to do it for you, which is what we call social engineering. Uh, so there's actually 10, if not 11 different ways to turn off that light. And then the next thing you think about is what makes a functioning light bulb? What makes a, night, a light bulb actually function, right? So then you get into the same process, and you go as deep as you can get into that process of understanding how a light bulb works. And that's really what a hacker does. Some people call it reverse engineering because you don't know what you're looking at and you learn how to learn really quickly. So now, that's the best way I can explain it to you. This is just a very a creative process 
in engineering. Now, this is also where a lot of innovation comes from, even though what you guys know is sort of the, la the, the, the big landscape. There's three major problems with cybersecurity today. Number one, the cost. Right now we're talking about it is expected to be trillions and trillions of dollars that are lost as a result of cyber crime. And so uh, these numbers are growing and they're affecting everyone. Ultimately, they are going to affect you not just companies, not just governments. The, uh, you know, it's going to roll downhill and it's going to ultimately ex affect the way that it, you are being monetized, how things cost to you. Okay, so that's really one of the major issues is these costs involved. And then the second major issue is cybercrime as a service. Um, this is huge. And when I say it's a, it's, it's a big, big field in the sense of how much cybercrime is taking place. And, you know, they say that it's, uh, I think it's a thousand people get hacked every minute, two minutes. I forget what the numbers are saying now. But the point is that this is a growing, growing number. And then number three, we have this, this issue of the Internet of Everything. So we are now having more and more devices coming on that are communicating with each other. And so these are the kind of a, at a high level what the problems are. And there's not enough people to address it. Cybersecurity has zero unemployment. In fact, Forbes last year said that there's a thousand, I forgot what it was, one million jobs, that's what it was, one million jobs worldwide unfilled every year in the cybersecurity space. And especially in management, because most hackers don't do well with people. That's why they work with computers. So it's, it's very difficult to, to do that. Now, I'll show you a, an example of just how trusting we are of technology. And, uh, and why that's kind of the issue, okay? Uh, it's very easy to misuse or allow to violate your trust because we believe these devices so much, especially our mobile devices. We all have them in here. So I'm going to ask our stage manager here to pick somebody out of the crowd here and bring them on stage. And, uh, and I'll show you sort of one of the very simple hacks that can lead to a very big personal breach, okay? So uh, let's see. Come on up. Don't be afraid. It's going to be okay. I am not going to release your pics online or anything like that. Hi. Hi. What's your name? Sissy. Sissy, nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. Where are you from? I'm oh. from here, actually. Right on. Give it up to Portugal, by the way. We're having a great time here in Portugal. <laughs> All right, Sissy. So are you having a good time here in, uh, in yeah. Web Summit? Yeah. yeah. Right on. Okay, cool. So what I want to uh, demonstrate here is a very simple thing. And there's a lot of ways mobile is on the rise, obviously. And in fact, desktops and laptops and computers are something that we're using less and less. We, we tend to use our phones more than anything else. And the interesting thing about it is we actually don't use our phones as phones that much anymore. Um, we use them a lot more to do this than we do the, this. But we'll start with something very simple. Um, and uh, while Sissy's sitting up here, you do have your cell phone with you, I hope. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, cool. It's here. <laughs> All right, and what? Well, it's an iPhone. Is yeah, that the new iPhone, iPhone X? No. You don't have the iPhone X? No? Yeah. So there are devices that I can use, actually, to read everybody's number in here. Okay. Oh. And what's uh, going on? I'm getting a call. Okay, why don't you answer that? Uh, oh, wow. Uh, take it. Take it. Hello. Hi, Sean. All right, so I've taken, uh, can you hear me now? Hi. Hi. How what? are you? What? How are you doing? Who's calling you? Is that, who's, who's the number that's calling you right there right now? This is, this is Sean. This is not Sean. This is Sean. This is Sean. Hey, oh my God, this is not John. <laughs> this is you. <laughs> this is me. So this is a very simple thing to do, that there are devices out there that uh, in certain countries are illegal. I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure whether Portugal is one of them. But I'd be able to... That, that was amazing. <laughs> to, to give it up for her because she's... Uh, that, that was amazing. <laughs> thank you. Now, the reason this is kind of scary is because... Your phone number is actually used by many companies as one of the methods for authenticating that it's you. 
In the US, if you call the bank and the number that you call from that's registered in the bank account is actually one of the ways that they tell it's you. So I, again, with one of these uh, potentially illegal devices, I've actually captured everybody's phone in here, and I can go around and say, OK, let's pick a number. Let's find out. And so that's how I kind of got her number. And then I, I'm not going to get into how we got numbers from her number. But the point is, is that's just one of many different ways that you can fool somebody. I can also do that with a text, which is actually even worse, because it's kind of a one-way communication. If you get a text uh, from something that you already deal with, uh, the first thing a hacker does is to gather enough information before putting together the hack. And that is, then you would think that that text is legitimate. And if that text said something like, you know, your account has been breached, please contact our security department at this number, you would probably call that number, right? And that would not be the security department, that would be me. And these are just, just some of the small ways that mobile can be hacked. All right, so then we get into sending you an email, and then through that email, ending up at a website. And this email might come from your boss. This email might come from someone you know. Um, and ultimately, when you end up at that website, we can execute browser exploits and all kinds of different things. And these are the sort of things that are not necessarily known, meaning they are what we call zero-day attacks. They're not published anywhere, and no one knows about these exploits. And these, this is really you know, one of the most scary things. And again, one of my problems has been that for 25 years I've been working with companies and governments. Um, and yet my mom keeps calling me with computer problems. So I'm tech support, right? My printer doesn't work. Hey, I just got an email that says this. Should I click on it? Um, uh, this virus thing says that it's been quarantined. Is it still here or is it not here? And that's one of my problems has really been with that consumers have not really been addressed. Okay, so um, here at Web Summit, you guys will, have, will be the first to have a chance to, by invitation only, be invited to what I've been working on for the last, actually, seven years since I've moved to Hollywood and tried to address this issue for movie stars and movies. And that is to provide consumers with a solution that could be easily understandable, that could be something you can act upon, and that is visual, that it doesn't require you to understand what a port or an IP address is or any of this kind of stuff. But if there's a threat to your personal data, that there's a way for you to do something about it and visualize where your data goes. So it's a lot like the technologies that Facebook and Google use, and they monetize it in a different, they have a different business model, advertising, whatever it is. So it's machine learning. What I've done is basically taking, uh, you know, some people like to call it AI, but ultimately what I've done is take our brains as analysts, think of it that way, to analyze traffic and then turn that into something you can understand and act on. So with that said, I want to introduce you to what I've been working on, my project, the people behind it. It's kind of a little fun video. And then after that, we're going to get into the battle of insecurity with some amazing panelists, Rosario Dawson, Saul Guy, and Saul Williams. Thank you. And now it's time for the battle of insecurity. Let's meet our influencers. Sol believes we change and shape our world through the stories we tell. His passion to explore art and social change has provided a unique creative journey. From his early days as a founding member of the groundbreaking Canadian hip-hop group, Rascals, to creating and presenting TV shows, producing and directing films, writing books, managing other artists, all while implementing innovative socially minded business practices. Welcome to the Web Summit stage, Soul Guy.
Rosario Dawson is an actress and activist best known for her roles in Top 5, Sin City, Rent and Seven Pounds and most recently starred in Marvel Netflix's hit series The Defenders, Luke Cage, and Daredevil. Additionally, she co-founded Studio 189 with Abrima Urwea, providing a platform to promote and curate African-inspired content online, a supporting agency, and a fashion collection. She also co-founded Voto Latino, which aims to empower Latino millennials to vote and influence government. Welcome to the Web Summit stage, Rosario Dawson. Saul Williams is singer-songwriter, musician, poet, writer, and actor, known for his blend of poetry and alternative hip-hop. After gaining global fame for his politically charged and emotionally complex poetry and writings at the turn of the century, he has published five books, released five studio albums, performed in over 30 countries and read in over 300 universities with invitations that have spanned from the White House, the Sydney Opera House, Lincoln Center, the Louvre, the Getty Center, Queen Elizabeth Hall, and others across the world. The Newburgh, New York native gained a BA from Morehouse and an MFA from Tisch. He wrote and produced the 1998 film Slam, and starred in Broadway musical about Tupac, Holla If Ya Hear Me, since breaking ground in 2001 with his Rick Rubin produced debut album, Amethyst Rockstar. Williams has performed alongside the likes of Erica Badu, The Fugees, and Nas and recorded with Nine Inch Nails and Allen Ginsberg, as well as made countless film and television appearances. Earlier this year Williams released his most recent studio album, Martyr Loser King to widespread critical acclaim. Welcome to the Web Summit stage, Saul Williams. Hacking the dietary sustenance, tradition versus health. Hacking the comfort compliance, hacking to the rebellious gene. Hack into doctrine, capitalism, and relation of free labor and slavery. Hack into the history of the bank is beating the odds a mere actor joining the winning team. Hack into desperation and loneliness, the history of community in the marketplace. Hack into land rights and ownership. Hack into business law, proprietorship. Hack into ambition and greed. Hack into forms of government, systems of control, the relation of suffering and sufferance. Hack into faith, morality, the achievement of one faith towards another. Hack into masculinity, femininity, sexuality, what is taught, what is felt, what is learned, what is shared. Hack into God, stories of creation, servants and eggs. Hack into nature, biodynamics, biodiversity, cycles and seasons. Hack into time, calendars, Descartes, its relationship to doubt, is a wire to fear, the notion of control, the space-time continuum, the force of gravity, whether the opposite of gravity is freedom, hacking of freedom, power, responsibility, justice, the Bill of Rights, hacking of coincidence, the summer of 68, the 27 Club, number of people with Facebook profiles, people choose to share, people share too much, people seem lonely, people want to connect, people want to uplift, people need uplifting, hacking of self-help, self-sufficiency, and self-indulgence, hacking of crazy, hacking of lunatic, hacking of star, hacking of infamous, notorious, the effects of the construct of poverty on the psyche, the effects of the construct of race, the victims that survive. There is a panel marked survival. Three simple copper wires coiled round an orb, hacking to orbit equatorial landmines useful and precious metals, Colton as cotton. Hacking to hazardous, nuclear, blue clear, cloud forms and fish farms, cow farts and pig shit. Hacking to horse, industrial, digital. Hacking to code. Use your instrument as metaphor. Harness your craft. Hacking to the mainframe. Dismantle definition. Dogma and duty. Hacking to destiny. Hacking to dreams. Subtext and subconscious. Hacking to heart. Cardio. Congo. Blood rich in oil. Hacking to suffering and despair. Hacking to the unfair advantage of those lucky enough to be born into one family or another, into one condition or another. Hacking to the circumstantial evidence that proves the obvious and wakes the oblivious. Hacking to birthright, bloodlines, royal and tainted. Hacking to superstition, old wives' tales, the rituals of the shaman. Hacking to DNA, chemistry, the pharmaceutical industry, the modern day rape of the forest. Hacking to the coiling serpents, the time it takes for modern man to determine whether ancient women were foolish or not. Hacking to the database. Hack into the subconscious, the panel marked survival. Hack into celebrity. Hack into the cultural development of taste. Hack into violence, fear, and ignorance. How are they linked? Everybody give it up for Saul Williams. Bad. Bad. 
So this is uh, actually a conversation that uh, we've been wanting to have in a public forum like this for a while because um, as, uh, as a nerd um, <laughs> from a different dimension uh, and then <laughs> working with these guys and, and, and knowing these guys in LA, uh, it's been an interesting ride because uh, we come from a very different world. We're told that uh, you know, engineers and computer science is not an art and uh, it's more of a science. And so the first question I want to start with Saul here is, as a creative, uh, what does ownership mean in a digital space? Because, All right. Uh, well, first off, I think as a creative, you know, uh, I know that my signature is embedded in anything I create, you know? And so it's coded and encrypted with like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's written by me. And in a digital space, the main thing is I want to believe that the stuff that I'm putting out there you know, that that code is recognized to, in order to be competently, you know, uh, properly compensated or recognized for whatever, like, y you want your coding to be recognized as it is, you know, in this space. Yep, yep. What do you guys think about that? I mean, because that's one of the things that, uh, coming from the hacker world where we sort of began the open source idea of code, um, when music... Uh, was hijacked by a little thing called Napster, uh, the response of the music industry was one that uh, I think is what ended up hurting the music industry, right? So Saul uh, has been in the music industry as well as film and television for a long time. And, and what do you think about what's happened with music and ownership as far as the digital space? I mean, it, it, you start from a space like creatively is like, can you actually own anything? You know, like, right. you, you know, like in yeah. your, in your, yeah. when you're making something, it's like, it's a, we were talking about this, like, it's a layer on top of a layer of everything you've experienced. So as you put it out there, it's only industry that's come into like, that's, you know, the capital, capitalism in a form of commerce to, to kind of then judge how you're succeeding. I think what's most important is for any artist, anyone creative putting things out there is access. So ultimately, the fact that you have these new distribution platforms that are now, that are now on mass as opposed to scarcity, which yep. was for the longest time, it was scarcity. So everyone made a big, like, oh my God, what's going to happen? No one's going to buy, you know, if, if they're not buying my music, what am I going to do? When in fact, what was happening was reshaping itself, just like it did to, from vinyl to eight. I don't know. There you I'm go, you bet. Vinyl still, to CDs and so on and so forth. And then you have, but then you had, you know, now you're in a subscription-based place where, if it what was it, 15 years ago, everyone was like, the music industry is over. Right. People are taking in more music than they ever have. And they're actually paying for it through subscription models. So I think from a creative place, it's like you just want as many people as possible to access, access right. what you're doing. And I think that's the freedom that the distribution platforms give now. Yeah, because we also have to acknowledge that music was first hijacked by the music industry. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so that the digital space allows us finally sometimes, in some cases, to be more evenly compensated, even though the subscription right. model has not necessarily compensated artists at the level that we feel we deserve. Mm -hmm. right. It might level the playing field. Right. And you know? a direct access point now exactly. from, from the artist to the audience. Exactly. Where exactly. people are either doing crowdfunding or they're putting out their project and saying it's completely for free because the internet doesn't recognize patents. And right. they don't have to, which is the reason why YouTube can play anything. And it's up to then the person who made the content to actually take it down and make it an issue. But right. there is no, like, YouTube doesn't have to deal with that. Like any of these other big companies, they're actually not breaking the law. They're just, they're, what they're getting is clicks. That's what their job is. Yeah. So if you want to protect your property, then that's, the onus is on you. And that's really difficult if you're trying to make any money off of it. So it's been really remarkable to actually see this evening playing field because now distribution has a different kind of exactly. connotation. Yeah. You don't have like, this is, you know, there was the era of Prince writing slave on his cheek because mm -hmm. of the way that he had to deal with exactly. getting his, his, his music out there. And he was one of the first people, David Bowie, a lot of those folks yeah. who were the first ones to start tapping into the online space and going, I don't need this system anymore. Right. Yeah. Cut the middle, yeah. man. Yeah. No. In fact, that's, that's a very good point in the discussion we were having a little earlier backstage was around management because Saul used to manage uh, K-9 and was in management, artist management. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a talk on artist management. And I said, you know, how's, what do you feel about that? And, you well, know. it's just saying that it's kind of, it's become almost, the, the paradigm has shifted to where I wouldn't say it's irrelevant, but it's a different conversation because, like, you were, you're being forced into these, these kind of uh, models of like codependency and again, again, trying to feel like 
as an artist, your, your worth is not equal to wherever you're trying to access. When in fact, as you have this big, as you have access to everyone, then really you can start to map your, the way that you want to connect with people. Like you said, you might just want to give everything away for free. You might say to everyone, hey, come to the show and we'll connect with you there. Or you might make a film and just say, hey, we know a bunch of, um, amongst a group of people, we can do it for this much money. We're going to put it out on the internet. We're going to see what happens. It's going to increase in some capacity. So I think what happens a lot of the time is the tech changes, but industry tries to keep cramming a, a yeah. familiar model into people. And when you kind of click on and you're like, wait, I don't have to adhere to that, you all of a sudden fly past it. And then I think that's what you're seeing with a lot of young artists who are coming in who don't have the, 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 the same mindset, yeah. the dependency and thinking they have to kind of like ask for something when in fact it's like through creativity and ingenuity and then, and then access to distribution and tech, you can kind of do anything you want. Yeah. You know? So it changes the relationship. And changing like who the funders are, like there's all mm. these different apps and uh, companies that are creating and proliferating around just making the average person who has a bit of money into a supporter of art mm -hmm. and going, if right you on. give me this money and like I will make the art, art's not even made yet, yeah. but you're going to like invest. It's a changing the whole investment model, everything. And it's, it, it's allowing that diversity. So that's when like the net neutrality kind of stuff comes up or talking about certain roles and regulations, like as much as, I mean, we could get into the theories around like the criminal aspect of hackery that make that people get really afraid of but like when you start talking about those regulations you're losing out in diversity and then all the solutions exactly. and the creativity exactly. that's coming up, up from the bottom while the bureaucracy at the top is still trying to figure out how to give food to people mm -hmm. there's people at the bottom are going well just here that's how you do it it's really that <laughs> simple and I can do it right looking you right in the eye and I can do it because I created this app or I can do it because they're just having the means to do it and as you're talking about the scarcity to abundance mm -hmm. it's like it used to be the people at the top who could read and said the rest of us didn't have access to that information you just had to trust but now we're drowning in that information they're counting on us being just as oblivious of what's going on by drowning in it and being on that kind of clickbait stuff and it's good to see finally a pushback against that as well and going I don't want ads I'm getting around this like we're really figuring out like the average person is figuring out how to hack the system yep. and get away from like certain locks on their phones all that stuff because it's not what's allowing them to really creatively explore this moment in time mm -hmm. which has a lot of opportunities Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, I, I think that's the thing is I've always said that, you know, hacking in that term is not a negative term. It's, it's innovation in ways that we don't yet understand. Um, I remember the first times I went to Hollywood and uh, was in some of these big names that, uh, that you have to deal with as far as agencies and such. I remember, and this was about seven, eight years ago, they had a guy called a new media guy, right? And the new media guy was basically an intern um, <laughs> who was uh, supposed to, like, run a web page and stuff, right? Uh, and now I come back seven years later and the new media guy is this new god. The same intern, by the way. He's now in this big position. But the funny thing about it is there's nothing new about how they do media. Um, the word new is something that's slit them because the model is not new. They're still trying to monetize the old-fashioned way. But the beauty of it is that the creatives yeah. have surpassed that. Like you said, it went wow. So. But that's, that, that brings us to the issue of hacking in the sense of security. And, you know, you had the fappening and all these different things that have happened in Hollywood but, have, but are happening everywhere. Um, so one of the interesting things is oftentimes if I ask somebody, what is privacy to you, I get very different answers, uh, and especially when it comes to in a digital space. Or what is security to you? So I'd love to hear what you think security and or privacy is. Mm. Well, I mean, it depends. Of course, in this context, I think, of, uh, I, I think of my information. I think of my personal information. I think of, on one hand, wanting to have the freedom to gain access to whatever apps or information that I want, uh, to be able to purchase something or click on something and not feel that that click exposes me. Yeah. Right? So that, to me, that's the, uh, that's the essence of security in the digital realm, is to feel that my personal information remains my personal information. You know, yeah, and isn't sold or given away or... I think that's, we all feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about you? What does privacy and security mean to you? I mean, uh, it's actually interesting because it didn't come from anything of the sort of modern day stuff, but I, um, I had a tragedy in my family and my 26-year-old cousin died in my home and I made the 911 call and then that was put out. 
as entertainment. It was clickbait. Mm. And um, the family was really upset about it and kept being like, you know, we got to sue, we got to kick lawyers on this. And you can't because, a, you know, a 911 call is actually public record. Yeah, yeah. And it was this really, so I just recently just where they had a whole reevaluation about what, because earlier in the year I'd been hacked and I'd gotten like personal stuff put out there and I spent a bunch of money trying to take it down because I've got a teenage daughter and she would not want some of those things coming out while she's trying to go through high school. And I was, been, I was just like all in that space of control. Yeah. And suddenly I felt really out of control. And it was actually a huge relief. Um, I have to say, and I, I had a whole conversation with Caitlyn Jenner talking about that. Like, just being in this space where she has just now put everything out there, she just feels so free because there's nothing, there's no angle with which anyone can kind of get at you. So it's changing my conversation around transparency and honesty and trust and openness. And so it is more for me, more about that. Like if I'm looking up something, I don't want it to mean that now I'm going to be recommended something. Right. I don't want it to mean that suddenly if there's something, you know, I'm, I'm talking about something and go, oh, let me look it up. And then it's the first thing that pops up. And I'm like, my phone was listening to me when I wasn't even using it. That's yeah. not okay. Yeah. Like it's stuff like that that really bothers me, especially because it's making me just a click. And I'm wasting time looking at stuff that they think they want me to watch, which is terrible information or like just about making me feel bad about myself and the world so I can buy something. I want to have like the things that I'm interested in being rewarded. I want to like go online and read an article and be able to go, that was a great article and I want to give you money for that. I want to go more into where I see things going where people are just connecting with each other and going, this is great content, this is great art and I want to support that. I don't need to have a company telling me I have to pay this ticket for it. I want to give you that money. You know, and like, and yeah. really have an actual exchange. So it's really for me more about that experience than, than so much anymore. I think about that security and privacy thing. I'm really transforming my relationship to that. Well, that's great. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, that's, that's one of the things that I think, and, li and listening to you guys, that's, uh, that's the question I often asked. And, and like I said, I'd hear different things, but ultimately it had to do with that control, right? And, and we know we're, we're not fully in control of anything. I mean, a meteor can fall out of the sky right now, but, uh, but it's that uh, sort of feeling of safety. I think that's one of the things that we disconnect is, you know, this is all really a uh, discussion around safety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's security. We tend to forget that that's, that's just a component of safety. But I think that's the thing is like, I don't know that for myself personally that I, that I pay enough attention Right, like I kind of, there's a lot of assumptions that we make, I think, as we like fly at warp speed into progress. There's assumptions that are made that are, that are like, we were talking about it last night, you thought, you think that, you know, 1984, these ideas is something that you would have to, mm -hmm. have to have signed, you know, like that was imposed on you when in fact we've signed up for it. Right. Right, where we've got these, everything is two way, you start, you know, you, you realize it's like my speaker's two way, the video is two way. And so you start to think, wow, I'm actually not as, I don't know enough is what it boils down to, right? right. So that's right. why being in spaces like this or having friends that can inform me is helpful. But it kind of like, I realize it like, it kind of shuts, I shut my brain off a bit to it because it, it's, it's daunting, right? Because you kind of, you want to be engaged and you want to be connected mm -hmm. and you want to be secure. But so you'll go, there was a time where like, I would remember looking at my computer and being like, well, why should I put my credit card in there? Right. Right, like, how's this? And now it's like, I'm not even thinking twice. I'm just doing it. And, and restaurants are doing exactly. it. And, and apps Every, are doing everywhere it. Everywhere you go, you right? You can't buy something without giving your information. Right, but then you've got, but then they still want me over here to go to a, you know, I got to go to a, if I want to vote, I got to go do a physical thing. So then I start right. to, I'm, just, I'm trying to think about, well, what, what chambers are, what silos are we in where I can consume, 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 but when I want to take action, um, the digital space, which can yeah. be massively effective and a, really a tool for social change and social impact, is being, it's being kind of blocked security the other way. Whereas like, well, if everybody could, could vote electronically, we, can we change these systems and change these models? Because that's what we're talking about, I think. Yep, I think. Yep. As, this, as, as, as we emerge into new spaces, we want to bring these old models. But to me, I just keep thinking about the new models that are possible and where people can be empowered and where people can feel safe, as you say, or people creatively, you can be in a healthy environment as opposed to a toxic one. They can all work, yep. but not when you keep kind of pushing yeah, the past. Push, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's one of the things that I found interesting and I want to ask you guys about is, what do you think, anyway, as, as far as artists, that your responsibility is to innovation? 
uh, because I've had some very interesting <laughs> discussions, right? I mean, let me put it this way. I've, I've, I've spoken with artists who say, that's not my problem. I'm an artist and I'm just expressing myself. Mm. And I've spoken, and, and again, there's no wrong answer here. Right. But then I've spoken to artists who say, no, we have a responsibility because we create based on the input we get. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, even in, in the question of, of, of ownership, you know, like when you talk about that signature that's embedded in whatever you create, you know, there, if there is no innovation involved, then it's easily mistaken for it. Right. any other creation, and, yeah. right? And with hacking, like, I mean, we're also speaking about shortcuts, right? Yep. We're talking about finding ways of, of moving beyond the, uh, the gatekeepers of the existing or old infrastructure, right? And innovation is the way in which we can maneuver creatively around this in order to get closer to the heart of the matter, the heart of the people, or, or whatever it is, whatever it is that we're trying to get closer to through technology yeah. itself, which is a reflection of our own awareness, right? So innovation is key to creativity. It's key to, uh, to impactful survival that, that transcends this sort of, you know, uh, murderous, genocidal shit that we're used to. I mean, like, for example, uh, you know, like, you, th you also asked me about ownership. I think about what's mine, and I think about minds. Minds as resources. I think about mm -hmm. technology's relationship to analog exploitation, like the actual, like, resources that are used in the hardware yep. and what have you. And, but it also provides, the, you know, a means for us to say, wait, we could use wind for this. Wait, we could use this for this. You know, like, there are ways of moving beyond the old access points, which were exploitive, which were harmful, which, which you know, which led to violence and finding new ways if we can get around those gatekeepers of the existing infrastructure yep. who want to keep mining that like way that could still make some more money off of doing it this way, yep. you know? Yep. Um, so innovation is crucial to, to transcend the violence of, of, of you know, because creation, the other side of that is destruction. It's creation, destruction. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And, and that's, a, you know, that's a very valid point because the physical and the digital yeah. Right? Is, I think that's one of the big disconnects that, that occurs with this hacking issue, right? We tend to think that, uh, and in fact, even, even from a hacker's perspective, uh, you know, whether good, bad, or, or evil, or, or no, whatever, the point is, is there is a disconnect that what you're actually connecting to or hacking isn't a human. Even though there's a human behind that data, yeah. it's not a human. Right, so yeah. that disconnect is there, and then it's also there on the other on the other side as consumers. I think I, it's kind of funny that you hear the word virtual reality all the time, and as if it was a thing you put glasses on for. And no, you live in virtual reality right now. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the truth. You don't have to put any glasses on because <laughs> it's in your pocket and it's yeah. in the cloud and it's in the everything. What happens if we take away your phone and? I mean, half of us don't even know, you know, our home number anymore. So <laughs> if we even have a home number. So, <laughs> uh, I think that's that, you know, we tend to think that the opposite of the word, you were yeah. saying, the opposite of the word virtual is physical. Yeah. But we tend to think, no, virtual is more physical today than it has ever been. Yeah, Because exactly. it affects your your day-to-day -day and it affects everything around us. And well, that's the thing with this is that a lot of times we feel we're innovating, right? I know a lot of like app creators patting themselves on the back about some great shit that they've created. And it's like, but you look at the issues of the world, you look at the migration issues, you look at poverty, you look at all this shit, you're like, wow, none of that has changed. So what have we actually innovated over here? And how do we connect those things, yeah. mm. you know? Because in many ways, the virtual world is just a reflection of ours. You hear people now talking about colonizing space, which is a reflection of the colonization of the Earth. And we know, <laughs> you know, like it's, it, all these things are connected. So we have to innovate in order to, to find new ground, yep, yep. actually, to, find, to break new ground yep. and in ways that, that, you know, that do not create new standing rocks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, and in fact, that's a great segue because yeah. as... You know, two people who've been involved in this social activism in so many ways. Um, and I've been involved because of them um, in it. Um, I think there's a responsibility uh, that, that you... That goes back to that original question of, as artists, uh, how do you feel you're responsible for social change? And, and what I don't see enough of is technology just being part of that. So you could speak to that as, as someone who's a social activist. 
Yeah, I, I don't know that technologies, not technologists are not a part of it. It's that they're not always thinking about that first, but that is a lot of the residual effects. Like you're right. watching that with the refugee crisis and how WhatsApp is helping people unite families and how imp important that is. And, you know, so many other things that, that wasn't what it was created for, but are transforming it. But it, again, I think the human element conversation is, and you know, the keyboard warriors that really helped to kind of proliferate the conversation that was going on at Standing Rock yeah. and other spaces is so critically important. And as artists, we're the storytellers of that. So I love you standing up there and mentioning Colton, because I just came back from Africa. I was there for an entire month. I'm in Liberia. I'm in Sierra Leone. These are places that, you know, just been ravaged, you know, Sierra Leone just been ravaged by Ebola. But the construction and the infrastructure that just got put in there is remarkable. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at it and going, how come I couldn't get a, a visa to the DRC this time? to the Democratic Republic of Congo. I'm like, oh, because for the first time, I'm traveling through Africa and everyone's got a cell phone, if not two. And when you have that, that means more Colton and tin and tungsten and all the things that are having to be mined on the women's bodies and the communities that are over there. Yeah. So now it's not just Asia and, 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 the, and, the, and the Americas and, and the Europe that are needing those minerals. It's the entire continent of Africa. Yep. So like, it's actually going to continue to get worse there. And it's exactly that as where Unless people are it. anonymously texting each other and, and, you know, and trolling each other to the point where people commit suicide on the other end. Yeah. Like there's such a discrepancy, you know, like you're seeing more and more as these tech summits and things start to come together more and more and more people of color, more and more women are starting to join the conversation, more and more activists are joining it and going, Wait, okay, how can we use this technology, not just to make money and have this whole big on like Silicon Valley kind of experience, but like transform it so that the conversation around a successful tech person isn't just some white dude who, who dropped out of college, right. but actually is a woman who never went to school at all and created an app and is now Every. teaching coding to kids all across America. Yeah. With I, like I am the code, you know what I mean? So like the act, so the technology and all of those things might not have been created from that necessary spa space, but like in every arena, in business, in politics, in Hollywood, like it gets built, but eventually everyone gets to in some way, shape or form, start to really put their, put their stank on it. Yeah. And I think that's just incredibly important as, as artists, we are the storytellers. Mm -hmm. And because we've been the storytellers, you know, we were the storytellers who put out 1984 before it happened. We yeah. put out Star Trek and visualized where we could go before it actually existed. Yeah. So that symbioticness between the tech world and art, and art it, it is, we keep segmenting it, like we, they belong on different stages, but actually t they all belong on the same one. And that's why I always push back against this STEM idea because it truly is Steam. People, this was a meme election we just had right. in the yeah, United right. States. And like Elon Musk is talking about in 10 years, just like being able to beam pictures into your mind. So what is that going to mean for cookies? when I have to say yes before I like even know what it is that I'm accepting. You know what I mean? Like, and it's going into my head. Like, what is that gonna mean? My daughter's gonna be 24 then. Right. Like, that's crazy. You could have AI here, this woman, Sophia, who got, you know, who has legal status as a citizen in Saudi Arabia. She has more pr privileges than women in Saudi Arabia. We are calling human beings illegal. And you know, we got AI starting to, and the only reason why she looks like that is not because she couldn't look like a walking, talking, regular human being that you would not notice, because that technology completely exists. She could have walked up on this stage and you would not have known she wasn't a real human being. But they're making her look in a way that's digestible so that we can slowly start to get used to this new idea. But it is coming. So this conversation is critically important as we're going from hieroglyphics to emojis. Uh, yeah. You know, like we are really about just this art and how that's how we're communicating with each other in shorthand through tech. So having critical thinking around art and critical thinking about the people behind that technology is vitally important for humanity moving forward. And that's, that's why I wanted to have this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, yeah. the only thing to, the, the, you know, the, I think what, what I hear what you're saying, I completely agree, is you're just, it's like, we're shaping these narratives, right? Like we can either just kind of walk blindly into the thing that's happening or as artists and creatives and it's just everybody in general, changing the narrative is, is, is how we change the course of, of culture. Everything else comes after. You've got culture, consciousness, community. That's what yeah. you're pushing narratives for. So what are these new narratives do we want to accept? How do we want to accept AI? How do we want to dictate the, the direction of where we're going as opposed to because we're just the thing that freaks me out the most and probably inspires me the most at the same time and keeps me active making things and connecting to people and trying to learn and understand and be in new environments is that it, we can't be passive. 
right? You can't, you can't sit in the times we're living in and looking around what's happening and not think about, okay, how are we going to, how do we want to shape this? What is the narrative? How are we going to like, we find ourselves in these strange spaces because of the way that we aspire in, in, and define leadership and success. So if we start to redefine what leadership and success means as artists and creating different narratives of how we arrive there and being, become close to the things that we, we find difficult in the world, then, then we will paint pictures, we will tell stories, we will have tech mash up with whatever it is that's yep. new in order to combine something that people, young people especially, be like, oh, I want to go there, or will take us there. Because the young people that are processing information at this point right now, the things that they're thinking and seeing and doing and where they want to be in the world, if we can chill a little bit and listen and watch that and be able to open doors and facilitate those needs, they're, they're leaping past a lot of the stuff that we're so stuck on, right? I listen to my 13-year-old daughter, I'm like, what? Her and her friends, right? So I think that um, it's, it, it, you know, to, to what Rosario was saying, it's like, how do you bring these things together as opposed to siloing them? Because in my silo, it's very, really easy to run around thinking like, hey, everything's, everything's cool or even everything's bad and everybody knows it's bad. But I just tech will silo me if I'm not careful. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's one of the things that really troubles me is I got into computers because they were fun. <laughs> I had fun with them. Mm -hmm. Computers are actually very dumb machines. They do exactly what you tell them to. They don't, you know, that's, that's a higher level. That's the application, the programming. But the, ma the machine itself does whatever you tell it to. It's mm. the program that tells, that, that, that has the intelligence of the human behind it, right? Um, and I got into hacking because it was fun. Look what I can make this thing do. I can make it do something that the person who wrote this didn't intend it to do, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's which, art. Which is kind of fun. Um, yeah. yep. And so, but the thing is, is security and, and this hacking issue has turned into a very scary thing for everyone, you know? Um, and and that, that's why I've been trying to basically use all the things that I've learned from artists into software. And that's, mm. that's what I'm doing with this project is to try to use storytelling, to use visuals, and ulti ultimately make security fun. Because it should be something that, you should have fun if you could actually, if you knew where your data was going, you know, sort of, use it as a game to say, oh, well, I can control that. And I don't want that to go here, and I don't want that to go and there. Gamify and your data, right? Gamify your data. Gamify the experience of security. Uh, and then I think we can actually make an impact on security. So I want to thank uh, Web Summit, uh, all of you guys for being here, but especially these guys and my lady here for, for taking the time to talk hacking, talk security, but uh, more importantly, to talk about the social changes we can make with uh, data. So thank you, thank guys. Thank you, Ralph.